Okay, welcome to the uh, annual joint meeting between the uh, Board of Selectmen, the Financial Planning Committee, Appropriations, and the K-8 School Department, of course, with our special guest, the uh, Superintendent. Um, this, as I say every year, in my opinion, is the uh, second most important meeting that we have next to town meeting. Uh, this meeting is a chance for us to all get together and shake the snow globe and see what we have coming up for the fiscal year 2021 which we're just now beginning the uh, planning process for. The reason why this meeting always takes place in December is because this is the window where we have just closed out fiscal 19 and we know what our, our free cash numbers are and, our, and where we are in terms of uh, that budget. We have um, begun fiscal 20 and uh, in, in November at the tax classification hearing with the Board of Selectmen, we set the tax rate and actually finalized the fiscal 20 budget. And it's a fiscal 20 budget that sets the, uh, the uh, marker and the baseline from which we do our projections off of. So uh, in terms of this evening, uh, we're gonna talk about our fiscal indicators, which is a retrospective 10-year trend analysis that we update annually. And then we're gonna talk about fiscal uh, projections. We look forward uh, five years. And it's within that context that we uh, talk about uh, priorities and uh, opportunities and maybe some constraints that we might be looking at in the upcoming fiscal year. So in terms of the uh, meeting agenda, as I said, we're gonna look at indicators, five-year projections. We're also gonna look at what the uh, tax impact will be as we start to project out what the needs will be for our uh, services. Um, clearly that has a tax impact and we wanna be cognizant of what, what that is. And then last but not least, one of the biggest and most critical things that we accomplish, in my opinion, again, in this meeting is setting uh, expectations. There's a set of assumptions that go into trying to forecast what may happen in the future. Um, those assumptions are usually easier one year out, but we're gonna be looking five years out. The focus obviously on next or the upcoming fiscal year 2021 but uh, people need to, we need to build some consensus about these assumptions. And so that's part of the discussion and the dialogue that we'll have here uh, this evening. Now, last year we had a lot of new people and um, we spent uh, time going through all of the indicators. And, uh, and it was important, to, it's, I think it's important every couple of years to do that. So this year is an interim year. And um, unless somebody would like me to go through all of the slides and all of the indicators. No takers, really? Um, I'm gonna to try to focus on uh, uh, three things that are really in motion this year um, and, uh, and, and spend some time on those. So for the sake of continuity, you all have a copy of the presentation. It, uh, it's, it's considerable and there's a lot of great information in there uh, for you and it helps to remind you of the things that we've discussed in the past. But again, I'm going to move through the slides very quickly and I'm just going to pass over a number of these slides. I will say this, anybody who is interested in seeing the full presentation uh, and an explanation of what financial trend monitoring is, how we did it, what these, all these indicators mean, uh, please look at, on our website and the local access and uh, I'm sure there'll be a link up where you can go and you can watch that full presentation uh, if you would like to. So let's just start with what we affectionately refer to as our dashboard. So these are the 14 indicators that we track every year and they're uh, revenue indicators, they're expenditure indicators, um, they are uh, position uh, uh, indicators in terms of your uh, financial reserves, there's unfunded liability indicators and there are capital investment indicators. And so the color coordination is as simple as we can make it. Green is good, red is not good, and black is somewhere in the middle. It's either stable uh, or it's uncertain. So in terms of this evening, I wanna spend on the fiscal indicators portion, I wanna spend the bulk of our time talking about state aid and economic growth revenues because these are the things that I think are in motion and probably most relevant to our upcoming fiscal year as well as as well as the next couple fiscal years. This slide is a 30 plus year history of state aid. This is in nominal dollars. We refer to this every year. Um, the V's here, as you see, these are the recessionary periods that we've dealt with in the past. This is the most recent one. I always point out the profile differential between previous 
uh, recessions and the one that we just went through, these are V's, up and down, up and down. This is more of a check mark. And that means that we've, got, we've had growth, but that growth has been relatively slow to come back. Now, um, we also always say in terms of trend analysis, uh, this, you look at this, this looks like a positive trend. Uh, basically, this, this shows you that state aid has increased every year. But what it doesn't tell you is in terms of what it means to us in our operating budget as an indicator, is that a positive or a negative trend? And I know we've discussed this at length in the past. Although it looks like a positive trend, when you look at it in terms of a percentage of the operating budget, state aid it very clearly has been deteriorating going back to a high in fiscal 2003. I'm gonna say that again, the high of 2003. So you look back at this chart here, see this peak? We didn't get back to a nominal dollar state aid until out here, fiscal 17. And everybody knows that you know, a dollar in 2003 is very different than the value of a dollar in 2017. But when you look at state aid in terms of the percentage of the budget, you know, it's been deteriorating steadily over these years uh, from a high of 13% down to 8.5%. And those, anybody remember what it was as a percentage of the budget last year? Pretty close, it was 8.6. So you didn't know that we're gonna be pop quizzes throughout this. We're gonna make sure everybody's awake and on their toes. It was 8.6% last year. So it's not a huge decline, but a decline nonetheless. And the, and, the, and the message behind that is, state aid as a percentage of our budget is diminishing. And so it's being made up somewhere else. State aid is going up on average a little over 1%, 2%. Our budgets are going up on average about 3.5%. So that means it's declining as a, as, a, as a core revenue source. And in terms of the operating budget for Northborough, about 80% of our budget is local taxes. And historically, 10% has been state, state aid. So it's the second largest revenue source. So our second largest revenue source has steadily been deteriorating for the last 10 plus years. So that's something that we need to be very clear on because when we talk about growth and adding services and maintaining services that we currently have, uh, if, if your second largest revenue source is steadily declining, then that is going to make it difficult for us and it's certainly going to shift the tax burden more heavily onto our residents. That's just a fact uh, of, of the situation that we, we find ourselves in. So another reason why we do this uh, workshop this time of year and even this week of the year is the first week in December, the state legislature has what's called the revenue, uh, state revenue consensus hearing. And essentially what that is is they get the House representatives, the Senate, the governor, they all get into a room, they bring in the Mass Taxpayers Association, they bring in the Department of Revenue, they bring in economists, and they have this series of hearings where they listen to all of this input to try to do, similar to what we're doing on a much smaller level here tonight, build consensus around what the revenue outlook is for the upcoming year. And so that took place on December 4th. And the estimates right now uh, range in terms of, this is now these are state revenues, not our local aid, but the overall state revenues. The ranges uh, are between uh, 2 and 2.3 percent. And I've included in your handouts <clears throat> the Mass Taxpayers Association. This is their, their full report. It gives you all the history on state revenues, how we got to where we are, where we've been, and the thought process behind why they think state revenues are only going to go up 2 percent. So that 2% target is the mass taxpayers. The 2.3% uh, estimate is the Department of Revenue. And essentially they have a range and that's the midpoint of the range and that's what they recommend we use. So, so at the state level, we're looking at 2 to 2.3% in, uh, in revenue growth. Uh, and we'll talk a moment about what that translates into for us because it's not a one for one by any stretch. Now, if you remember this time last year when we talked about the state revenue consensus hearing, what was the, the, the biggest topic of everybody that testified and we talked a, a, quite a bit about it last time? Does anybody remember what the big theme was? The, the R word, right? 
Recession, recession. A lot, of, a lot of concern about recession. This time around, not so much. And the consensus was that recession is a possibility, but the consensus was that we're going to see slower revenue growth in the upcoming fiscal year, but they're not, um, they're not ringing the recession bell. So at least in the upcoming year, maybe year and a half, there's this feeling that the revenues are going to, and the economy is going to continue to grow in Massachusetts, albeit at a much slower rate than we've seen in the last few years. Now, what that means for us in terms of state aid is we're conservatively estimating our state aid increase in our forecasting uh, at 1%. And, uh, and I'll show you some detail of why that is a very, I believe, a very realistic assumption. And again, for the folks in this room, I hope as we go through this information that you feel that that is a fair and reasonable assumption, particularly for fiscal 21. Now, we are always conservative in our state aid estimates, um, but uh, you know, we may get 1.2, a 1.3, or 1.4 in state aid when the budget finally gets approved. And uh, as we always say, when, if we get any additional state aid, the only place it can be applied in November when we set the tax rate is to reduce the tax impact. So any conservatism that we spend or have on our estimates for state aid, at the end of that process, if we get a little bit more, it just goes to reduce the taxes. And when I say a little bit more, I'm talking about we might wind up with 30 or 40,000. This is nothing earth shattering. It's a $70 million budget roughly. They do that as a percentage. It does, my calculator doesn't have any, that many spaces to show how small of a, a percentage difference that that makes. The big caveat that we always say is um, when it comes to state aid, unlike our local receipts or some of the other forecasting that we do, you, know, you may take moving averages, you may do linear regression analysis, whatever makes sense for the set of data that you're working with. But when it comes to state aid, that, you can throw that out the window because it's a political process. And I'm going to show you another slide that is directly out of uh, page three of that Mass Taxpayers handout. So it's on the bottom of page three of the Mass Taxpayers handout. This is the state's revenue projection. And I thought this would be very good uh, this year to give you a little bit more insight into why we're so conservative on our state aid numbers. So, the state uh, operates off of income, sales, corporate, and other. So under income, you have withholdings, capital gains, other non-withholding, sales tax, and then corporate taxes, okay? Now, if you look at, this is, these are actual. So going back to fiscal 16, 2.22, 1.4, and then look what happens in fiscal 18 and 19, 8.41, 6.82. Anybody want to fathom a guess what happened there? What, what, did suddenly the economy just go into overdrive? What happened there? Think back. It has something to do with the overall office. Federal level. Federal taxes. Federal tax law changes that took place in December of 2017 affected cap particularly capital gains here, withholdings. Um, so when you look at this was negative 15, negative 16, all of a sudden it's positive 42.37%. 22.12%. So what you have here is a policy impact on the revenues that the state took in. And if you read the ta mass taxpayers analysis, and if you read the Department of Revenue's analysis, when they look at forecasting their revenues, they're controlling for those one-time policy impacts because that wasn't real growth for them. It was a, a one-time flash in the pan. But now you start looking at fiscal 20 and 21, and what do you see? 2.27, 1.87. Back more to a normal, slow economic improvement, that check mark we just talked about, something looks more like that. Now, now, let's dig into this a little bit more relative to Northborough. Fiscal 19, 6.82% at the state level. So fiscal 19, I just said, we've closed the books on fiscal 19. We know what we got in state aid. Anybody want to fathom a guess what we got in state aid, actual state aid? In terms of percentage, about 1.6%. So the state took in 
our state aid up, went up 1.6%. Now we're looking at two and less than two potentially percent increases. Anybody want me to for, uh, build into the budget uh, an assumption that we're going to get more than 1% in state aid in fiscal 2021? No. This is important, guys, because we, we all have to be in agreement that we're not being too conservative or too rosy in what, we're, what we think is coming around the corner. And this type of data is important when you look at that. 6.82%, we saw 1.6%. By the way, in another handout that you have here, and this is great because this is all, all current contemporaneous information for you. There's a, a two-sided sheet from the Mass Municipal Association that says, act now. This sheet is when uh, basically uh, detailing the, the, the state closed out fiscal 19, like we just closed out fiscal 19 and we have our free cash. They closed out fiscal 19 and they have their free cash. Their free cash is 1.1 billion with a B. Okay? Now before anybody gets too excited that that one billion dollars is somehow going to find its way into our hands as supplemental uh, budget. Uh, right off the top, the state spent a good chunk of it. They spent it down during the fiscal year as the estimates came in. They spent it down to 870 million. And then they put 587 million of that 870 million into their rainy day stabilization fund. And so when I say, when you look at what happens with the state revenues, that it's a political process, you have no idea what's going to trickle down to us, the town of Northboro. But this is a perfect example. Uh, out of 1.1 billion, we're going to be lucky to see a couple of nickels. And so they did things like they put $20 million additional money statewide into Chapter 90, which is our roadway funds. The schools may see a little bit in charter mitigation, transportation for regional schools, sped circuit breaker. Those are good things, and I don't mean to sound ungrateful. But these aren't things that are going to push our state aid number after the fact up anywhere near that. We may pick up another ten or $20,000, you know, $30,000 here or there, uh, which again is appreciated, but it's not going to have a material effect on our, on our fiscal uh, uh, fiscal 2021 budget. And again, any supplement, uh, most of these supplementals, by the way, they don't come in on our cherry sheets. They don't just send us a check. Years ago, when the economy was doing great, those of us that have been in this business for a couple of decades in mass, right, when the state was doing really well in the early 90s, it was pretty routine midway through the year. You get a little email notice, hey, good news. Our revenues are coming in higher than projected. Here's a supplemental. And it was just money with no strings attached that we could spend on whatever we would like. Those are the good old days, like Billy Joel said, but they're long, long ago at this point. So now supplemental all seems to come in little earmarks. Chapter, nine, uh, chapter 90 funds, some, some uh, special education circuit breaker, through these different programs, some of which we can take advantage of, many of which don't apply to the town of Northborough. Because as you can imagine, if they're trying to uh, backfill need, the needs going to the neediest communities. And, you know, for better or for worse, uh, you know, Northborough, based on our socioeconomic um, uh, in, uh, background here in, in, our, in our makeup, we don't, we don't usually rise to the top of need. So therefore, we don't tend to get much. So that's the story on, on state aid. The next one I want to spend a little bit of time on is uh, economic uh, growth revenues. There's another handout that looks like this. And it's this chart, but it's all the data behind it so you can see. Now, economic, economic growth revenues are important for us to track. These are, these are things like, um, or they include motor vehicle excise, uh, which is heavily weighted towards people buying new vehicles. If you, you know, if you look at your own motor vehicle excise, you pay a lot in the years one, two, it scales down to, you know, 20, to, to very little money by year four, which is why I usually drive old vehicles. Um, it includes hotel and meals tax, and it includes building permits and new growth, so new development, because as new development comes in, it gives us new and expanded uh, taxes, right? 
So the key with these types of revenues is they're, they're very heavily based on the economy, hence their name. They're elastic in nature, which means when the economy is doing well, they tend to grow. And when the economy is not doing well, they start to shrink. So they're a leading indicator for us if things are going poorly in the economy at large. Well, let, let's, just, let's just put this out there. If, if, the, if something's happening or you're hitting recessionary headwinds or people are concerned about their jobs, right? What's the first, what are the first things that you cut back on as individuals? You stop going out to eat, right? You stop going on vacation or reduce vacation. You maybe don't buy a new car, you postpone that. Uh, you might not do that kitchen renovation or the addition or improvements around your house. On a larger scale, at, at, for corporations, they may decide not to make investments not to build new facilities or expand their facilities. So all these things impact this revenue trend. Uh, and that's why we watch this. This is, a, this is the canary in the coal mine for us. And so as we kind of sit here, and I remember last year talking very, uh, at great length about a possible coming recession. Now that has been pulled back somewhat, but that's still looming. So we need to watch these, uh, these revenues um, uh, this revenue indicator, uh, and we need to understand what's happening. When, when they go south, they're going to go south very quickly. It's not going to be a trend so much as they're going to start just to drop off. When the economy plummeted, you know, building permits, they stopped like overnight, right? New cars, new vehicles, people just immediately stop buying new vehicles. So let's look at what's going on just so we kind of see what, what's happening here. So we had this little bubble back here in 2012 and 2013 at 4.8 uh, or 8.4% rather. Anybody re remember what happened in 2012, 2013? Avalon Bay. Avalon Bay. Very good, Don. So we had uh, 382 units of residential housing built. And so that, that's building permits, new growth, right? And then <coughs> things sort of tapered off and quieted down. In here, 2014 and 2015, we bolstered our local receipts in our economic growth revenues by adopting the hotel and meals tax, right? That brought in $450,000 to $500,000 in new revenues for us. And we used that to pay for our other post-employment benefits. But, but that pushed these numbers up, which otherwise would have slid a little bit more. So that's the way down here. And we're kind of hovering around the low sevens, right? It's not... I don't see any warning where, uh, you know, to be concerned about right now, but you actually see this little uptick here. All right, here's another question. This, I, I get, people got to participate here. Why are we seeing an uptick? New growth, New growth on Bartlett Street. You're going to get a gold star today, Don. <laughs> we have, and we're going to talk about this in a moment, we have a million square feet under construction on Bartlett Street. A million square feet and about 100 and over 150 acres of industrial property being constructed. And that means building permits and new growth. So as we look out, new growth in fiscal 19 uh, is, 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 was decent. Fiscal 20, we just set the, we just set the uh, tax rate, as I said, in, uh, in November. Very positive new growth. And as we look out in fiscal 21, 22, we think we're going to see decent new growth. After that, we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, so this is the chart you should all be familiar with. This is from the tax classification hearing. This is uh, $92 million, Northboro Crossing, Avalon Bay, right? This is the town's largest economic development in its history. And then, you know, that ends and things drop down to more of a normal. And then we see this dropping down here. We've had five years of, of relatively low economic development. If you remember over those years as we went through this, this um, process, uh, talking about indicators, I said, listen, it's not a panic because although it's low and lower than we've seen, we have the raw materials in the form of vacant industrial land that will be developed. So you have the raw materials for additional growth and additional expansion to your tax base. We just don't know exactly when it's going to come. Well, good news is it's coming. It's coming now. So fiscal 20, fiscal 21, and fiscal 22, we think new growth is going to be 
45, roughly 45 million at this level for the next couple of years. It's not going to be up here. It's never going to be up here again, guys. That's not going to happen ever again because that, that development, uh, we don't have the space for that, that type of development. So let's talk about this in a little more detail. What do we have to work with in Northborough? See these large pink sections? This is the eastern side of the, uh, southeastern side of the town, and then the, the southern tip of Northborough. These are our two large industrial areas in town. These are the areas 15 years ago when we were talking about what's gonna happen in Northborough, where are we going to grow, where is our tax base expansion going to come from? Those are the two locations. Now, in terms of the space, all, although you've got a very, if you look here, this is all industrial zone, right? It looks like a large parcel. A lot of this down here is actually Sudbury Valley trustee. The aqueduct runs through here. It's not, it's zoned industrial, but it's not developable. In terms of what's developable, these are the, the yellow areas that you see here and down here. So this is out on Bartlett Street, and let's take a look at what that is. So out on Bartlett Street, and just as a, a way to orient you, this is A. Dewey Pile and FedEx. And on the other side, this is 301 Bartlett Street. That's fully developed. So if you drive down Bartlett and that large uh, transportation with the blue windows, painted blue windows, right? That's 301 Bartlett Street. And then across and next to FedEx over here are the other, that large, uh, a large uh, development and these are like 330,000 square feet. These are, these are massive buildings that are going up. So that's under construction. And then over here, um, this is actually accessed through the town of Marlboro, but all of the tax base goes to Northboro, which I love. Um, Mayor of Marlboro is not happy about that. But, uh, so all the traffic goes through Marlboro, but we get all of the tax benefit. These parcels are, are collectively, as I said, about a million square feet that are, that's either built in the process of, or in the process of being built right now. And we're gonna realize that new growth. We realized some of it in fiscal 20. We're gonna see more in 21, and the last of it coming through in 22, as they get tenant fit outs and they get leased. Um, so that's what we're looking at down here. But, but, but just take a look at that. When that's done, and again, this is all under construction right now, that section of town is built out. Now there might be uh, five acres, six acres, 10 acres, something, you know, you might see something smaller that could potentially go in there uh, on, the, on the edge of this. But in terms of what we have uh, continually been saying is our future, our future economic base, the future is now. And it's being built literally as we speak. So now let's look at the other area. This is the south, the south, uh, southern tip. And uh, by way of orientation, this is the mall. This is Wegmans. This is Avalon Bay. This is already built, this site two here. That is the second phase of the mall where Margaritaville is and the medical center and uh, all of that. That's completely built out right now. There's a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, buildings there that aren't leased out yet, so, but it's built. And then you look across the street, these are the ball fields. This is New England baseball, all developed. They've got a couple pads in the front here that they've been sitting on. Originally, they thought they were gonna put a couple of restaurants in, but as you know, restaurants have had a difficult time lately. So they're not quite sure what they're going to do. They're looking at maybe another medical building, but they're not sure. So there's a little couple things that might drop in right here by the roadway. Other than that, that whole southern tip is developed with the exception of this 50 acre parcel, which is Kimball sand and gravel. So that's an active mining uh, operation that's occurring there. When they're done, they're gonna have a beautiful flat um, pad for some development. And I say some development because I'm not quite sure what would go there. Nobody's be building office space. Nobody's building retail, right? So there's, you know, we're not quite sure what that will become. But in terms of the town's future economic development and our future new growth, which helps us grow our budgets on an annual basis, we're gonna realize the next big push over the next couple of years. And then 
Kimball sand and gravel, we're going to dip back down to a, a lower level until something happens with Kimball sand and gravel. Or we might see uh, up on Barefoot Road or Goddard uh, Road, you might see one of those existing facilities that are developed get redeveloped or expanded. That could happen as well. Uh, and again, that's, that's going to be, think of it this way, you, you're going to need that type of redevelopment in the downtown and in the existing commercial industrial areas in order to get $30 million of new growth each year, right? In order to have any budget growth for us to spend. But you're not going to see 90 million, you're not going to see, you know, 50 million or 60 million. The new norm is going to be when that graph, I'll come back here, this graph drops down in this area right here. That's going to be our new norm. We're going to see a little hump here. It's going to drop back down similar to this. And that's where we're going to, we're going to hover, guys. That's going to be the new norm for us. And so the moral of the story here is that we are, as a community, approaching build-out. Now, what does that mean? Why, why do we spend so much time? Why am I spending so much time talking about this tonight? Because, again, it's about assumptions and expectations. And so the expectation from no department should be that their budget's going to grow 6 or 7% a year. When state aid is growing 1%, and essentially all of our growth is going to be coming from taxes on existing residential, commercial, and industrial properties, and to a lesser extent, new commercial, industrial, or residential properties. By the way, anybody, as far as residential developments are concerned, anybody want to fathom a guess on, in terms of build out on that, on that side of the equation? How many new houses we built last year? Anybody remember from tax classification? No, I don't want to see. <laughs> Six. Six new houses and two condos in the form of a duplex. So eight in total. What does that mean? We don't have large tracts available for large subdivisions. Now, on a positive note, we know that residential development has a very heavy impact on our services. Schools, police, fire, DP, everything. It has a service impact, uh, much more intensive than these wonderful commercial uh, buildings that go up, and they pay $175,000 in taxes, and unless they have a, an emergency at their site, um, tend not to draw regular services. They tend to pay more in taxes than they, they take in services. And just as a side note from my friends in the school department, before anybody feel ba feels bad that they pay more in taxes than they get in services, they get an educated workforce. We educate their workforce for free. So they do, there is, it is appropriate that they pay taxes. So uh, I like to remind them of that when, uh, when they say, well, we, we pay $200,000 in taxes, we don't take any services. Where did all your employees get educated and who paid for that? So, so that's important, it's an important point to make. So um, that's just the reality of where we're looking at. And, um, and so as we talk about budgets, and not only in fiscal 21, but 22, 23, and, and out, what we're going to see is North Broad as a community is maturing. We're no longer the young kid in the block. We're not the one that's growing the most. We have. There were, there were times where we had the most economic, during the worst recession in 80 years, in Central Mass, we had the most economic development. That was a nice thing to help us out, right? It couldn't have come at a better time. But we've realized that growth, and we're realizing the remaining growth in those raw, open land, and it's, and it's in a matter of a few years, it's going to be gone. It just means that we need to, uh, in terms of expectations, realize that we are going from a growing organization to a sustaining organization. So when we talk about budgets and what the budgets can grow, it means that it's going to be something more sustaining and less on the growth front. You live in a community that's laying down huge tracts of subdivisions and uh, large numbers of kids coming in, that's going to have an impact on the schools. It's going to have an impact on police and fire and everybody else. But if you're not growing in that regard, then we need to talk about maintaining what we have. And the sensitivity to that maintaining what we have is going to be in the tax impact, right? Because nobody wants to raise taxes, but if those economic development revenues are going to be flat, flatter or more flat, um, state aid isn't growing, you know, if we want to maintain, ta uh, maintain services, it's going to be a, an increasing burden on the, on the taxpayer. Sorry, I don't mean to, everybody all of a sudden looks a little bit bummed out here. This isn't bad news, guys. We're, 
Let me tell you why this isn't bad news for Northboro. Because it's not bad news for Northboro because we've managed ourselves well and we've planned well. If you find the, the increases have tapered off or disappeared on you, yet you have a huge deferred maintenance in terms of your, your infrastructure and your buildings and you, haven't been do, and you haven't put money aside for your liabilities and all those things, now the revenues drop off and you have these structural unfunded liabilities and deficits that you now need to make. We're maintaining our buildings, we're maintaining our equipment, we're maintaining our roadways, we're maintaining our infrastructure, we're putting money aside for our, our unfunded liabilities, we're on a scheduled plan to pay for our pension liabilities. So that's built into our budget base. So if our budgets are going up three, three and a half, four percent in that range, that's a sustaining budget, we're not going to stop taking care of our equipment and our infrastructure to hold on to our services. What we have here is real. The foundation to our organization is solid, and that's a positive thing for Northboro that you might not find in other communities. All right. By the way, if anybody wants to talk about any of these indicators in any detail or has any questions, I'm happy to do that. I want to do one pit stop. So I focused on state aid and economic growth revenues. I want to do one quick pit stop. I did mention our uh, other post-employment benefit uh, liability. This is a big issue uh, for the state and for all municipalities. Now, on a positive note for us, we, we, we had some positive, um, some very positive uh, news to report on this, on this particular indicator. And that is, you know we've put uh, half a million dollars aside starting in fiscal 15 to deal with our unfunded liability. So our unfunded liability, which is this line here, has grown. 34.8 million up to 44.9 million in fiscal 18. Well, we've been putting money aside and that money has been earning interest. Right now we have $3.8 million in our trust fund. And so when you look at this, it's, it's, it's I can't say it's a positive, tr it's, a, it's a favorable indicator because the money and the unfunded liability is huge, right? But we are on a, an upward trajectory in terms of our funding ratio. When you look at pensions and OPEB, you look at it in terms of percentage uh, that it's, it's funded, right? So we were at zero. We started putting money aside. In fiscal 19, we're at 8.25% funded. Now, I know that's low. That's better than the vast majority of municipalities in this state. Um, but what the positive news is, is that because we're putting money in and the money's earning interest, of that 3.8 million, about 700,000 of that is interest earnings. So again, just like your, your own private retirements or pensions, right? It has a multiplier effect over time. And one of the benefits of that is the actuaries that look at our liability are able to give us the benefit of the doubt now that the assumption, the discount rate in terms of what we're gonna get on return, this line here, 4%, you know, six, five point, six point two five. So when we do our projections now, the assumption is we're gonna to continue to contribute, we're gonna to continue to earn interest, and based on these revised assumptions, and we don't make the rules, there's, there's some board of actuaries that goes off in a cave somewhere, and they chant, and they come out, and these are the new assumptions that are, are going to factor into how you figure out unfunded liabilities. In fiscal 18, our, our unfunded liability was $44.9 million. And right now, and again, this is on paper, it's down $10 million. It's down $10 million because they've tweaked some of the assumptions. But the big thing about that is that we have put money aside, we're earning interest, and they're giving us the benefit of the doubt that we're earning interest. Now the other thing that they've done, and the, the big assumption here is that our pension liability is uh, on track to be fully funded in 2030. And the assumption built into these projections are that when that happens, we'll divert the money that we were putting aside for that and bolster our investments in OPEB. So again, a lot of assumptions, a very, very long timeline. But in terms of uh, our, financial, uh, our financial reports, when we go out to borrow for the upcoming library, uh, not library, we already did the library, fire station project, right? 15 to 18 million, whatever it comes in ultimately is. 
we're going to get rated by the bond rating agencies. One of the top things, one of the primary things they look at is our unfunded liabilities. And one of the reasons we got upgraded the last time when we went out to do the Lincoln Street building project, they noted the fact that we had a funding plan and we were starting to take care of our unfunded liabilities. And the result is lower interest on that, on that debt. So this stuff all matters. This isn't just some uh, mathematical exercise that takes place in a vacuum. When people look at our financial statements, this speaks to our credit worthiness as an organization. So, yes, you have a question, Leslie? Um, you speak about the assumptions. Just to clarify, are these assumptions that change just for Northboro? Do they change for everybody? What, what? Uh, no, the rules, the, this board of actuaries that come up with these, uh, these uh, uh, assumptions, um, they change those assumptions for everybody. The only thing specific to Northboro was that we funded it, right? We're putting money aside, and there's the assumption that, again, in 2030, we're going to be able to put additional money because, in theory, our, our pension liability should be paid off. These are the same assumptions that pretty much everybody's making. So, but the big factor for us is that we're putting money aside. This, this discount rate, that's based on the fact that we're putting money aside. And last year, we increased our OPEB contribution from five hundred to five hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So, again, remember I was saying we're looking we're looking at a sustaining budget moving forward. That sustaining budget includes, as part of its base, taking care of this liability and funding it to the tune of five hundred fifty thousand a year. So again, what we have here and what we're sustaining would be real. We don't, you know, it's not a house of cards. And I say that all the time. Uh, you know, you could easily balance a budget, and we 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 jokingly uh, we say, uh, look, if 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 I were within three years of retirement, I could give you three years with no budget, no no tax increases whatsoever. I could be a hero. Then I'd leave, and whoever came behind me would be absolutely in trouble, because there'd be nothing left to do but raise taxes. And I would do it by not putting money aside for our unfunded liabilities. I'd stop buying new equipment for a few years. Uh, I you know. You stop putting uh, money aside for capital. I mean, that's, it, it's, it's, it's a game. And the thing that's different about Northboro versus many communities is we're very upfront about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And our, our foundation to our organization, our budget foundation is strong. And it's based in good policies and principles. And it's based on making sure that people have the information uh, and the process, which is what tonight is all about. It's about information and process. It's so the school committee knows, you know, we're, we're being clear about what we have to grow. The Board of Selectmen knows, you know, these are, we want to increase services. We always want to increase services, right? Or enhance services or add staff. These are the constraints that we have to operate in if we're going to be sustainable and if we're going to maintain our positive financial condition. Okay? Yes, Laura. Um, for clarification, in 2015, uh, we were able to add funds because of the meals and restaurant tax? Is that what you said before? Yeah, so, so it actually came out of this process. You know, we put all these indicators together and the ones that are glaring, the ones that are unfavorable, you need to talk about them. And you need to figure out how you're going to address them. And if you're not going to address them, our job as staff is to tell you these are the repercussions if you don't. And so we had to start putting money aside. And the idea was we adopted the, uh, it was a newly approved at the, by the legislature, a hotel and meals surcharge. And so the thought was that those would be paid for primarily by people out of Northboro. And as a Northboro taxpayer, you could avoid it if you wanted to. So it was a way to generate revenues to take care of, uh, to partially take care of our unfunded liability without raising taxes. And that took place as a policy discussion with this group and in the beginning, not everybody was on the same page because there are some folks who said, well, I just don't like taxes. Well, you have to pay for it. Do you want to pay local taxes or would you like to try to get people from out of town to pay? And the beauty of it was the surrounding communities all had adopted it. So, you know, it's not like you were going to escape it. Um, but that's how we did it. So we, it raises about $500,000 and, and that's how we started funding our OPEB. Now that was unique to Northboro because if you live in a town that didn't just build a mall and seven restaurants, that probably wouldn't be an option for you. But looking at our situation, that was a good policy discussion and a decision that was made by the Board of Selectmen to adopt that, and it worked for us. 
So that's, that's really one of the magical things that happens as an outgrowth of this process and this meeting is identifying these things, talking about them, and coming up with uh, possible solutions to how we're going to deal with what might be unpleasant information. It's not always unpleasant. Uh, it's positive, too. So, Anybody have any other questions on OPEB? Okay. So um, I'm going to move on past the indicators. Again, this is the, the look back. And there's a lot of indicators, 14 indicators. Again, we focused on three that are in motion that, that are worth talking about. The other ones are stable. Nothing's really happening. But if anybody has any questions on any of those, I'm more than happy to, to speak to them. But uh, again, going back to our dashboard, these are favorable. State aid's unfavorable. Can we do anything about that? Oh, see, that's a trick question. The answer is no, but actually yes. No, we can't do anything about how much state aid we get. But yes, we can take do things to put us in a position so that if the state gets themselves in trouble, we have a pressure relief valve for us. And that means financial reserves. So if the state aid cuts our, gets cut mid-year because we're in a bad recession, we have 9% of financial reserves that we can go to short term until we figure out what to do, right? So again, it, it's, it's, it's this multifaceted in terms of, of, uh, of how these things can be interpreted. Uh, the other unfavorable, pension liability. It's unfavorable, but we're on a schedule and a plan. There's nothing more to be done. There's no policy discussion or action to be taken. We are paying about 11.4% a year increase to deal with our, our pension liability. And by the way, before anybody gets too worked up over that, um, particularly taxpayers who aren't municipal employees in Northboro, um, that's for past sins. If you're a, if you're a group one, uh, municipal employee in, in Massachusetts, which is anybody who isn't police or fire, and you're hired after 1996, you essentially are funding your own retirement. I came up here in 1997 from Connecticut. When I retire, I will have a very good pension. I will have essentially self-funded that pension through a forced savings plan. So when people say, oh, this, this, this pension liability is unfavorable, we need to cut benefits. No, you don't. That's, that policy decision's already been done at the state level. Anybody since 90, 1996 on is paying their own way. We're paying for the sins of when they set up the pension and people that fight, paid 5% in that didn't pay their own way. That's what we're dealing with. That's why we have the liability is for past sins, not for our current or recently hired employees. So again, there's no action to be done there, but it is on a funding plan. Other post-employment, we just talked about that. We're making progress. Are we putting enough in? No, but we're doing a very reasonable job. Yes, Jason. John, can you just clarify um, the circumstances of qualifying for those benefits and how that's been one of our legislative priorities to ask for some assistance at the state level? Yeah, in terms of uh, post-employment, uh, our post-employment liability is essentially uh, retiree health insurance. And so uh, the Board of Selectmen, through their legislative priorities, has uh, has consistently asked the legislature to uh, modify the, the mass general laws that uh, pertain to other post-employment benefits. See, right now, if you, if you work uh, 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 10 years or more, uh, what is, it, is it 19 hours a week? 19 hours a week, 10 years or more, more than 20 hours a week. I was 19. 20 hours a week, 10 years, you qualify for retiree health benefits. And that is by state statute. And what we've argued and asked for through the legislature is to do the same kind of reform that they did to pension, which is to scale it based on the hours that you work and the number of years you work, you get a graduated benefit. It's not 10 years and you get everything. Um, that would help reduce our, if they did that, that would help reduce our liability as well. So, but just like um, health insurance, if you work more than 20 hours a week, it's not our choice you qualify for health insurance. If you work more than 20 hours a week and you're employed by any municipality for 10 years, you're vested and you have, uh, you have access to retiree health benefits just like somebody who worked full time. So that's one of the things that, again, we advocate uh, at, the, at the state level for the types of things that would give us a little bit of relief. And I don't want anybody to walk away thinking that that's some kind of magic bullet, that we're gonna see a huge drop 
Um, we just don't have a lot of people in that situation, so I don't think it'll be a big factor for us. But even, you know, it, it's just a matter of fairness that you get a graduated benefit based on how long you work and how much you work. So, any other questions on that? Yes, Laura. So, when you were talking about pension and how people were, uh, from 1996 and before, mm -hmm. uh, get the, the past and benefit. So, in 20, 30 years, those, those pensions, well, maybe four years, might not be, we won't have those anymore, right? Well, that's a, well, I don't want to say it, but eventually we all are going to pass. So yes, that, that's, that's how it resolves itself. Okay. As they say in the health field, when your loss ratios are high, it will resolve itself. But yeah, what happens is they, those people, they retire, they take the benefit, and then they, they eventually no longer need the benefit. So it will eventually be phased out, and uh, all pensions will be self funded Essentially, well, with the exception of police and fire. And the reason for that is police and fire can retire at 80% at 55. Although the, 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 in actuality, very, very few of them actually retire at 55. Um, they tend to work at least, you know, another five years or so. But, uh, so when you hire police and fire, and that's why, again, the Board of Selectmen knows this, we spent, rather than just hire, we, we had a request for 10 more firefighters and 10 more police officers a few years back and we did a full study because we wanted to make sure if we're going to hire police and fire they are going to affect our, our, our OPEB liability and our pension liability and so we want to make sure that we're hiring the right mix at the right level to give the right services and uh, and I think we did that and we did that through good information and good process okay all right I want to move on now uh, so so we're going to move uh, so just in terms of wrapping up on the financial condition which is the purpose of the indicators is to assess our financial condition. Uh, again, we're relatively good condition, our tax base is strong. We've got great diversification. You know, we don't have all our eggs in one basket with one employer. Even if you think about the mall, which is our largest taxpayer, we've got Wegmans, we've got, we've got multiple tenants in there. They're not all going to disappear overnight on us. Um, but we have R&D, we have medical, we have retail, we have industrial. Uh, it's a very it's like a retirement portfolio. It's very diverse, which is what you want. Our reserves, as I said, are healthy at 9%, so if something bad happens at the state level or otherwise, we have a place to go short-term while we figure out a long-term solution to make it whatever we're dealing with more sustainable. Debt, uh, I, placed, I passed through that one, but our level of debt is below 5%. Our policy is to be between 5 and 10%. When we approve the, uh, hopefully, the fire station project, when that moves forward, and we take on that debt, our level of debt will probably go from where it is now, it's just below 5% to 6% or 6.5%. So we are managing ourselves well because we're not adding debt in the general fund unnecessarily. We pay cash for most of our equipment and so forth. We've paid cash for roofs on schools even. Uh, reliance on uh, one-time revenues uh, is below 1% at this point. And as I just said, uh, we've put $11.3 million in pay-as-you-go capital since fiscal 12. And that means, we again, we've done roofs on schools, five $600,000 projects, we paid cash for that. We bought a, a new engine for 688000 or that's what was approved. The chief got it cheaper than that. Um, uh, we paid cash for that. New, new uh, police cruisers, DPW trucks, equipment replacement. We're replacing those things on regular, clear, best case scenario, whoops, schedules. We're not deferring those things. So the departments have the equipment they need to do their jobs. In terms of potential issues, we kind of touched on these. You gotta watch the pension liability, make sure that we're funding that. OPEB obligations, we're gonna need to, periodically every couple years, we, we have to have another analysis done that looks at what the liability is and how much progress we're making towards funding it. So we need to watch that. Um, uncertainty regarding state aid. If we got 1.6% from, from the state when they were booming, what's going to happen when the economy slows down or potentially goes into recession? We're gonna, we may see not just flat, but we've seen in the past negative state aid where they cut your state aid and they do it mid-year. Um, and then uncertainty um, uh, 
around certainly economic development. And we know fiscal 21, 22, we're going to have decent new growth. After that, we're, not, we're going to be at a maintaining level. So these are, again, things that we just need to be cognizant of. And then, you know, what's happening in the economy? Watch those economic growth indicators and just be always watching what's happening so that we can maneuver when we get information, we can maneuver and make decisions so that we don't dig ourselves into a hole that's harder to get out of. So in terms of fiscal 21 with regard to the budget, we need to continue putting money aside for OPEB. Um, we've settled our contracts. So for fiscal 21, uh, our cost of living increases for our employees is 2%. So for 21 and 22, our contracts are settled. It's 2%, 2%. Um, this is something different. Uh, you know, we usually have very conservative new growth. Because this stuff is in pro progress of being built, it's not just permitted in speculation. Um, we're banking on 45 million in new growth for next fiscal year. That's baked into our assumption about what we're going to get uh, for new tax dollars. State aid lags. Uh, we're going to continue to maintain infrastructure investment. That means especially uh, pavement. We're, we put $1.1 million into our, our roadways. We need to actually increase that if we can. But at a minimum, we're going to maintain that. And then last but not least, um, there's no Enron accounting. There's no shell game that's happening. There's no punting of responsibilities. Um, we're complying with our comprehensive financial policies that talk about reserves and debt and capital investment and things of that nature. Okay. So that's looking back. Those are the indicators. That's the retro 10 years. Now we're going to talk about next year and in, in five years forward. Um, in terms of our projections, the methodology has not changed. Uh, when you, if you're a community that's doing financial projections, you're, you fall into one of two categories. You're at the limits of Prop 2.5, and, and that's all you have for new revenue on, on the uh, tax side. Or, like Northborough, you have levy capacity, which means you're not currently, you're not taxing to the max of Prop 2.5. So any given year, you can, you can raise more than the limits of Prop 2.5 within that, that levy capacity. And so if you are like us, it becomes uh, less an, an exercise of, of forecasting the revenue so much as forecasting the tax impact and trying to target a reasonable tax impact that allows you to maintain that levy capacity for as long as you can before you're at the limits of two and a half. Let me just say this. Uh, we used to be at the limits of Prop 2.5. It's not a great place to be because when you figure out what you need to maintain your services and you need another fifty or $60,000 to just maintain your current level of services, you either have to cut something or seek an override. Our levy capacity is our pressure relief valve. It ebbs and flows you know, based on we have new growth coming in and we might dip into levy capacity, new growth replenishes it, and so you have that, that pressure relief valve, as I said. And that has served us extremely well over the last couple of years because it means we can dip into that to deal with problems that come up, financial problems or issues or pressures that come up. Uh, most recently in the last couple of years, and again, we're going to talk about uh, momentarily, is um, the high school assessment. Our shifting enrollment at the high school, more kids from Northboro going and less kids from Southboro going, and that means Northboro is taking on a larger share of the operating budget expenses at the high school. That's not a policy decision on the part of the superintendent of the school committee. That's just the reality of demographics and decision making at the family level about whether or not to go to the high school or a private school. But that is putting a lot of pressure on the budget and on the tax increases. If we, didn't have, if we didn't have that pressure relief valve to work with, it would require an override to be passed, uh, or the high school would not be able to maintain its current level of services. And I say that it does, uh, it, because it's not a case of they would just cut the budget. They would have to cut the budget in a way that would not allow them to maintain the current level of service that, that, that they have now. So again, through no fault of their own, enrollment's up, Northboro has a bigger share. How are we going to manage that? How are we going to deal with that? We're going to tap into our levy capacity. And hopefully, that enrollment will shift over time such that 
we get a break and maybe it, it goes back the other way because if you look at it over years, it's gone back and forth between Northboro and Southboro. Right now, it's shifting onto Northboro. Um, ironically enough, do you know when it shifted onto Southboro? When we had the recession. So for us, that was great because our assessments were relatively low. For Southboro, I think they did a lot of hooting and hollering and, and screaming because they were really under the gun. But in terms of our methodology, we focus on the top three. Taxes, state aid, motor vehicle, those are 95% of what we live on. And again, the goal of our, uh, of our projections is to, to, to just maintain what we have now and to reasonably deal with uh, growth in terms of adding a position here or a position there, right? But not adding whole new departments or radically expanding uh, services. In terms of uh, the assumptions, as I said, this is new. Every year we've, uh, we've forecasted $30 million in new revenue, and, 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 uh, or new growth, rather. We're forecasting $45 million, which is about $776,000 in new taxes. And we're forecasting that for fiscal 21 and 22. Because we know out on Bartlett that stuff is being built. It's, it's, it's here, physically. So we're going we're gonna to take advantage of that. And the reason why we're... we're we're doing that. Now, historically, we are very conservative on our new growth because you don't, even though someone pulls a permit, they can decide just not to build and things get delayed all the time. So it's hard to predict what your new growth is going to be. And so we're conservative. And then when it comes time to set the tax rate in November, if we got more new growth, it generally will lower the projected tax impact. So we say in fiscal 20, we said we projected a $361 tax impact. And then at the end of the day, in November, when we set the tax rate for real, we got more new growth. It was just shy, just a little less than $300, okay? This is, I want everybody to listen to this because this is important. That's not going to happen this time next year. When you set the tax rate, because we're pushing it on the front end, guys, this is a little bit different. We're pushing it on the front end, so the tax impacts that we're forecasting are going to be pretty close. They're not going to be radically less not going to be $60, $80, $100 less because we're pushing these numbers up here on the front end. Otherwise, these, this stuff looks really, starts to look ugly. Unused levy capacity, we're going to access that. State aid's 1% level uh, local receipts. And again, no one-time gimmicks. We're going to continue. The things that are in the budget base that make our foundation solid, OPEB, uh, taking care of our, uh, of our infrastructure and equipment, all that stuff stays. These assumptions also include the fire station because it wouldn't be realistic not to include a significant increase in debt service to pay for a, a much needed project. And then let's get to the piece that most people are interested um, in, the, the key budget. So this assumes that the Northboro K-8 and the general government budgets increase 3.5% in fiscal 2021, and we can talk about whether or not that's going to be reasonable. And then thereafter, 4% annually. So one of the things that's going to happen as we, as we look at these projections and we revisit them again next year is that 4% growth rate might be a little too rosy. We've, really, we've, we've been forecasting 4%, but we've really never, we've been at between 3 and 3.5%. Three and so the forecast assumes 4%. That's where we'd like to be. That would give us room to expand and, and to address some of the service demands a little bit better than we're able to. But the reality is, um, in terms of tax impact, I don't know that that's, that's going to be realistic for us. So that's one of the things we're going to have to talk about uh, down the road. This is the tough one right here. Algonquin Regional High School. Right now, we're assuming, based on the enrollment projections provided by the superintendent, that we're looking at a 7% increase uh, in our assessment. And now's a good time to kind of draw you to a very helpful memo that, uh, that uh, the superintendent provided to us, and it's one of the handouts. I think uh, the superintendent did a good job of providing the contextual information in terms of the tables that show the shifting enrollment. If you look at table A on the, on the second page, you can see years ago, um, Southboro's assessment or Southboro's uh, percentage of the operating budget based on enrollment was, was escalating. In fact, in fiscals 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 
they were on the uptick. Those are recessionary years too, as I just stated. Um, so it ebbs and it flows, but if you look for the last couple of years for Northboro, fiscal you know, 18, 19, 20, and 21, we were going from 58% to 63.15. Again, this is not because services are expanding. This is simply enrollment. And our share of the budget bill shifts as our enrollment goes up. Um, one of the weird or interesting things that we spent probably the last two weeks, by the way, uh, Greg and, and, and Becky and Jason and I have spent a lot of quality time together for the last two weeks. Uh, two or three times in person and multiple phone calls a day to get a handle on this because this is, in terms of the forecasting, this is the biggest issue we're facing, the biggest impact on the fiscal 21 and likely the 22 budget. So if you look at the table at the bottom, table B, this shows you how many kids from the Mellican Middle School 8th grade go on to the high school and how many kids from Southboro eighth grade go on to the high school on, on average. And so you can see what's happening here. Um, you know, on average over these years, 99.66% of Northboro kids go on to the high school. On average, 85.72% of the Southboro kids go on to the high school. And so they probably have a tendency to go to private school more for, what, for whatever reason. But, but here's the killer, is you look at fiscal 19 and 20, the very last line, the number of kids going from, uh, to the high school in Northboro is 102%. So we've actually gained students. I assume that's kids moving in. And Southboro has dropped down to 81.25. So what's causing this swing? So Northboro has 15 or 16 more kids, and Southboro has... 30 something uh, less kids, the swing, the swing is about 50, 56 kids in total. So you wanna know why our assessment's going up? That's the swing, that's, that's the impact. So, um, so the conversation to have is what, if anything, can we do about it? And, and I just wanna say, you know, at this point in time, you know, these are the assumptions um, that we're working with. Uh, as far as the high school, there's really, uh, the budget can't be reduced enough to get that assessment down to three or three and a half percent. That would be laying off staff. So what can, if anything, can we do? Uh, we, we've had, and I'm not, I'm not dropping a bomb here on the superintendent in public, one of the, the frank conversations we've had is that the school, at the high school has an E&D account, an excess and deficiency account. That's essentially their free cash, their budget surplus. And years ago, uh, you know, if you look at the table D, uh, we used to apply, you know, between three hundred and six hundred thousand dollars of E and D or free cash to help suppress the assessments. So uh, one of the conversations we've had, and we, the ask at this stage of the budget process, is that the superintendent and school committee look at that and have a conversation about what can be used to help give a little bit of financial relief. Um, during this very difficult time where we have escalating, uh, escalating enrollment. So, um, so that's where we are in terms of the assumptions and how we, how we got here. And the other thing that we did through this exercise was to try to project when, when this uh, enrollment shift might, might turn around, might, might stabilize or hopefully even, my friends in Southboro, shift back onto onto Southboro. And it looks like um, we're gonna have a difficult time this year, fiscal 21, uh, fiscal 22 as well. And then after that, uh, we're kind of hoping, uh, at least forecasting that, that, that it will start to shift, stabilize and shift back. So we know we're gonna have two, at least two difficult years with our, two more difficult years, 21 and 22 with our high school assessment. So this is all, you start to see how all these pieces start to come together. So we've got good new growth for two years, but we have very high assessments for the next two years. And so we're going to be eating up levy capacity, and we're not going to be able to replenish it after that. So you start to see how all this stuff begins to play out. Incidentally, uh, ACIVIT enrollment is also up. We didn't get any break there, guys. 25, their, their assessment's going to be up 25%. 
because again, they think they have 10 more new students from Northboro coming. I don't know where these kids are coming from, but we need to figure out, you know, <laughs> is this eight families to a house somewhere or something? But, um, but uh, you know, in all honesty, what does that speak to in terms of us as a community? It says Northboro is a desirable place to live and a desirable place to raise a family. The schools are excellent, the services are good, people want to move in here. And that, I think, is what we're seeing. So let's now play this out. What does this look like as we shake the snow globe? We have more information about fiscal 21, the high school assessment, and, and so forth. And then we're making assumptions about those out years, the ones I just said, which is 4% budget increases in the out years. But in fiscal 21 and 22, um, we're looking at 3.5 for K-8 and the uh, general government, 7 and 5 for the high school. So this just plays the, the budget, uh, these are the, the, how the budgets would escalate. The interesting slide is this one here, which is when you, this is the balancing slide of uh, revenues and expenditures. And the yellow line here is our, is our levy, our unused levy capacity. So if you remember uh, a year or so ago, we had $2.9 million in levy capacity. So this is our ability to tax additional, uh, apply additional taxes to our, to our community without the requirement to go to the voters for an override. The end result is still the same, make no mistake about it, the taxes will go up. So I've said this before, I'm from Connecticut. In Connecticut, there is no Prop 2.5. And, and in Connecticut, the exercise every year is what we're doing here, which is backing into a reasonable tax increase that you as elected officials and policy boards and committees feel comfortable supporting to town meeting into the community. So if you don't have Prop 2.5, which is an artificial cap, and it's an arbitrary cap, if you don't have that, every year you have the discussion about what's a reasonable tax increase for the level of services we want in our community. Since we're not at the max of 2.5, that's essentially what we have to do every year because we could raise an uh, additional $2 million in taxes. It's not free money. It's not like we got money in a savings account that you're just going to take out. You're, you're levying this tax and people are going to pay it. Okay? And I can't stress, stress that fact uh, more. So we had 2.9. We've had a couple years of very difficult uh, shifting enrollments at the high school. We've dipped into our levy capacity and big chunks of that have been to deal with this shifting enrollment at the high school. Uh, currently, when we set the tax rate at the selectmen's meeting in November, when all said and done, our levy capacity is 2.1 million. If we, based on the assumptions we talked about tonight, if we uh, move forward, our levy capacity will drop to about 1.6 million. And so the, the game here, guys, is reasonable tax impacts for stall for as long as we can, hitting the wall of Prop 2.5. As I said before, once you hit that wall and you're at the limits of 2.5, if you need $20,000 or $50,000 to make everything work, you just you don't have it. Our shortfall is more significant. In terms of uh, the fiscal 21 budget, based on these assumptions, we're at about $576,000 of levy capacity. That's what we need in order to balance this budget based on these assumptions. More concerning for us is as you play this out with the assumptions that I said in fiscal 22, the levy capacity goes to 1.1, then 670, then 271. In fiscal 2025, that 393,000 up there is an override that would be required to maintain services. So this is a conversation I had. I just concluded all of our labor negotiations. And I showed these charts and these tables to the employees and I said, listen, in order for us to maintain 2% wage increases, a little bit of staffing adjustments here or there, we have to use levy capacity. So the 6 or 7% that you would like or, or you're, you're um, proposing clearly is not something sustainable for us, right? Um, and, and, and they get it. They get it. Uh, and our job when it comes to labor negotiations and wage increases is to keep ourselves in that sweet spot where we're able to recruit and retain good people. Because if you drop below that, you start losing your good people because they have options and you're stuck with the folks that you would like to leave 
We don't have a lot of those folks, but you're stuck with those people and you're losing your good people. Now, you've seen this table before in the past. And every year when we show it, it shows by the time we get out to year five that we're in an override situation. And then the next year comes and Jason and I magically show you the same graph that still has that override five years out. Well, how are we able to do that? Well, we do that, we're able to do that because we have been getting new growth in. And when those, those new growth numbers are good, you're basically replenishing your levy capacity. So a perfect example is in fiscal 20, the year that we're in right now, we dipped into our levy capacity, $900,000, not to keep beating up on the regional school committee here, but, or the regional school, but, but probably half a million of that was due to the 8.3% uh, assessment that we got at the high school because of shifting enrollments. Their budget only went up 3%. Our share of that budget went up 8.3%. That's where we took the hit. And so on the front end, we said we're gonna need to dip into levy capacity by $900,000. And we taxed additionally our residents and our businesses that 900,000. But then when it comes to this calculation of levy capacity, we got pretty healthy free, uh, pretty healthy new growth, right? And so we really only reduced our levy capacity by about 600 and 670 something thousand dollars because we made up some of that with additional new growth. That's been our saving grace as a growing community. The new growth gives you the levy capacity. The message, if you take nothing else away from this presentation tonight, is that that new growth is not going to be our saving grace after fiscal 2022. It might happen if Kimball Sand and Gravel comes in or something big happens a couple years out, but it's not going to be steady. It's going to go back to a low level and then it'll spike one year if we get a big project. But those big projects are going to come more less frequently and they're not going to be as big. So what I want you to take away from this tonight is that this is much more realistic, that that's what we're looking at. And so what does that mean for us? It means on the front end here, we need to make sure that we're, we're mitigating wherever possible those budget increases so we're not eating into that levy capacity because it's not going to get replenished like it did years ago. So if we can use some E&D to get that 7% assessment down even a little bit, I hope we can. Um, you know, budgets moving forward, we're forecasting 4% increases. I don't think that's going to be sustainable. I think we need to probably start dialing that back to 3.5, which is actually what we've been going up. So things are going to get tighter, and we're going to start moving into a sustaining mode. Now, this isn't, this isn't bad, as I said. Our budget and what we do is pretty solid. It's not a, a, a house of cards or a shell game. And so we just need to be careful when we negotiate contracts, when we decide to expand services, and we're always, always being requested to add all day kindergarten, more police, more fire, more DPW, plant more trees, uh, build more commons, take on more White Cliffs land that you have to maintain. Those things have real um, service impacts and you can't ask a department to do a serve to, to provide a level of service if you don't give them the resources so that's the balancing act as policy boards and committees that's your job that's that's your that's your wheelhouse guys and the way you are able to make these decisions comfortably is with good information and good process which is what this is all about and so when you get approached in the supermarket by somebody who likes, wants all day kindergarten right now, and it's the right thing to do, or wants, I don't know, more, more trees planted or more, uh, side, more sidewalks built and plowed by the town. This is the context in which you need to have that discussion with them, and that's the context in which we need to make those decisions. It doesn't mean we can't build more sidewalks or we can't plow more sidewalks or phase in all day kindergarten, which is something that school committee is trying to do, but it means it's not gonna happen overnight. Nothing's gonna happen overnight. It's about expectations and sustaining the financial condition of the town, not just today or tomorrow, but in the future. And the toughest thing is I know you folks, uh, many of you have served on boards and committees for a long time. 
a long time. That is my benefit. That's the staff's benefit because it means you've seen this stuff more than once. This is a lot of information and I didn't even cover it all tonight, right? But you see it year after year. You have a chance to look at it. Look, if you don't agree with anything I've said here tonight, and you want to, let's talk about it. Because when you all leave the room tonight, you're going to go back to your departments and your people and the folks that elect you or, or contact you. And you need to feel comfortable about what you're saying to these people in, in, in terms of expectations. So now's the time to ask the question or to question the assumption. Um, and, um, and again, this isn't bad news. This is good. You know how many municipalities would uh, managers or school departments would love to be able to sit here today and say, I'm pretty confident we're going to be able to maintain services for the next five years. We're not going to be able to grow things wildly. We'll be able to have a little bit of staff here, a little bit there, tweak services here a little bit, tweak services there a little bit. Basically respond to natural growth that we're seeing in our community, right? I think that's a pretty good place to be. But it does have, you know, again, it does have uh, limits. So let's talk about, yes, go ahead. Do you have a question? So if we project a, a more realistic than it's ever been in the past consumption of the levy capacity, mm -hmm. and although it's slower growth that we're really not under threat of recession, but it's looming out there, yeah. what, what's the time period that we would make a decision that says rather than a 4% plan on budget increases? That's a great question. So really what you're asking is, what you're re really what you're, yeah, exactly. So, so um, what Scott is asking is, you know, these are the assumptions and this is what it looks like right now. When, when would we change these assumptions? Every year. This is why I know some people, uh, particularly I got board members that have been with me for the entire time I've been the administrator or, or worked for the town, 16 years, right? You, Jason, Dawn, Leslie, I mean, you guys could, you could do this presentation because you've heard this material so often. Uh, but you need to, but, but, what, but why would we do it every year? It's because every year it's a check. We look back five years. I tell you what we're seeing in the immediate 12 months and how that plays out for five years. And then we do all do a gut check. Does this make sense to everybody? Is this reasonable? So Scott, the simple answer to that is this time next year. Because this time next year we'll have another set of data. We'll have another set of forecasts. We'll have more information about where the economy stands. Right? And so this is why we do this stuff every year. And it's important that everybody be here to hear this. You are the leadership of the community. You're the folks that are going to get caught at the supermarket or Ellsworth McAfee Park or walking down the street. And people are going to say, we really need to build more sidewalks. We really need to have all our sidewalks plowed. We really need to have all day kindergarten. We really need to plant more trees. We really need to buy more uh, municipal facilities. We, we can do all those things at a certain level, but in a priority order and at a level that we can sustain. And that's the context. But you have to do this every year. And, the, and that's why I try not to kill you guys with a three hour presentation going through absolutely everything. But, but we, have people, we have people that come in and out of this process on boards and committees, elected or appointed that they're sitting here and this might be the first time they've ever heard any of this information, particularly if they never served on a finance or appropriations or, or a border committee. They have had no exposure to this and they're hearing this for the first time. That's why we do it this way. But every year you need to look at this stuff. So next year we'll have a whole nother set because we'll know, most importantly, what did we actually get? Did that 45 million in new growth, was it actually 55 million or 60 million, right? If it was, we're going to get a little bit more breathing room. If it was less than that, it's going to be a little bit tighter. So, One more question. I think Absolutely. I the previous one for 2021, we've got the line. Yeah, the pre previous to this slide. We've got the capital articles, you know, mm -hmm. line. Is there, um, and then the, the out years are, are empty. I just, understanding that sheet. The, la the last line about the capital articles. Yes. This year? Other no, 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 all, all the, all the way to the So we've got it in 2021, but not the oh. other years. Oh, yes, that's, that's good. You picked up on it. Somebody actually read the detail. I appreciate that, because yeah, I like good questions. This is, uh, in fiscal 21, that's what we're estimating we have to spend on capital projects in fiscal 21. 
these out years, I don't know how we're going to end the fiscal years. I don't know what we're going to have for free cash. But in terms of this, this whole balancing, it's an in and out. It doesn't impact anything because you're only going to spend what you have. So we know what we have for the upcoming year, but we don't know what we have in these out years. But whatever it is, it's not going to impact the formula because you have free cash and you're going to spend it on capital. It's an in and out. Because we're using one-time revenues to fund a lot of our capital needs, right? That's been a huge saving grace for us because we've been able to make investments but not increase the tax, uh, the tax impact for our residents. John? Yes. On, uh, just kind of, I understand the thing about the, the ratio between North Carolina and South Borough with the schools. Mm -hmm. uh, but looking at table C in the memo kind of thing, uh, it looks like enrollment's dropping by about 15% between now and you know, halfway through you know, 2026. Yes. Uh, should, we see, should we see a decrease due to the fact that the number of students is dropping? I mean, it's about 225 students. Yeah. I'm not gonna speak for the superintendent, but, but certainly that's, that is a, a, a factor. Like right now, it's a factor at the, at the middle school. At the middle school, we're seeing reduced. Uh, well, and that's one of the reasons why, that's one of the reasons why Right, it all, it all bubbles up and through, you're right, and that's the trend. But last year, if you remember, working with the superintendent, although we had our initial forecast had a three, and a, a three or three and a half percent for the K-8 the, the, uh, budget, there was some savings due to reductions in staff at the middle school that allowed the, that budget to come in at 2.73 instead. As far as the high school, you have certain fixed costs, and at some point, and this is not my area of, of expertise at the superintendent, but at some point you may be able to reduce staff. Uh, it all depends on how many sped kids you have. It, it's, it's, a, it's a process. That's a level of detail where the, sup the superintendent working with the school committee would look at that exact information to see what they have for savings. And I know they do that every year. And then when they meet with the appropriations, appropriations will ask those questions and, uh, and we work through that. There, there may or may not be some savings there. I'm, Again, I would defer to the superintendent on that one. Um, but, but that's something that you would absolutely look at. You know, it's no different than if, uh, you know, on our side, if we have a lot less seniors, although that's not the trend, uh, you know, you would have less services. Or if you have, as the fire chief would tell you, if you have less, um, if you have, you know, if you're building, you know, senior housing, you're going to have more demand. Or if, you know, suddenly senior housing leaves, maybe you have less. But that's... That's the within the year uh, review of, 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 of where you can save money. And I can tell you, when I say we need 3.5% to maintain our level of services, that takes into consideration any savings that we can find anywhere, anywhere in any given year. It's also things like you know, retirements. You have somebody retiring and somebody coming in at a lower, a lower pay grade. You know, that gives you a little bit of breathing room. All that stuff together, though, we still need close to about a 35 to, to at least I on my side, I can tell you I need three and a half to maintain services because I'm paying for health insurance that's trending over over that. Pension, as I said, is eleven point four percent, you know, debt service, all that stuff. So but that's a discussion that first starts between the superintendent, his staff, then the superintendent and the school committee, then the superintendent of appropriations. Just like on my side, it's me, my staff, me the board, me appropriations, and then we get to town meeting. All right, so let's get to the part that nobody really wants to look at, and that is the projected tax impact. Because as I said, if you are accessing that levy capacity, it means that you are increasing taxes to meet your needs. So right now, based on the assumptions that we have for fiscal 21, we're looking at about a $389 increase in the average single family home tax bill. If, you, if, things, if things trend, nicely for us and all the budgets are basically going up about three and a half percent we're maintaining our services that translates roughly into about a three hundred dollar just 295 to three hundred dollar increase in the average single family home tax bill okay this is about ninety dollars more than that that has a lot to do with the high school assessment that's pushing it up um, so the difference here, though, uh, 
Typically, when we show you these numbers, like I say, we're more conservative on the new growth. We use 30 million, not 45. So when I show you this number and we show you this, this is a change in the formula. This is a change in our projection that I'm highlighting for you right now, that we're usually much more conservative on the new growth. And therefore, when it comes in higher, that number ultimately drops by 50 or $60, right? That's kind of a nice, we usually show you this is sort of the, the upper limit, and we hope to come in a little bit below that. We are now, because of the nature of the new growth that we have, it's, it's being constructed. We're comfortable pushing it on the front end to 45, but that means, you know, it could be 50, could be 55. I, I don't know, we don't know. But, so that might come down a little bit, but it's not gonna drop by $100, guys. So it's, it's could it be 350? I don't know. But that's a much tighter number than what you've seen in the past. Because I don't want people to walk away and say, well, you, you know, they always tell us that and it always comes in about 60 or $70 less. We're taking it on the front end. If we didn't, if I showed you a $30, $30 million increase, that number would be 50, $60 higher. And so we're trying to, where we really have a better handle on the new growth, this particular round, round of new growth, we're trying to, to take advantage of that to, to, to hone the model a little bit more. But as you look out, 22, you start picking up debt now for the fire station building project. And so, you know, again, these are estimates to be determined, um, but you're seeing, you know, the taxes are going to bump up. Now, in the next five years, which is all this projection is, we know we're gonna do the fire station project. We're gonna do something with a fire station. It, the level, the exact amount of how much it costs is still to be determined. So we're carrying that. But what we're not carrying in these numbers is that we're gonna to need to do something with Town Hall, and then at some point we're gonna to need to do something with Peasley. Now both Town Hall, we're not gonna do the fire station, Town Hall, and Peasley in the next five years because these numbers would be unsustainable. Um, so there are other needs that are going to factor in here that are going to continue to put upward pressure on the taxes. Now, again, this is a, a wrinkle. I, I can't stress this enough, guys. Prop, prop two and a half is an arbitrary and capricious formula, okay? It, it's, 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 it's just a number that somebody picked, okay? Um, and the way new growth gets calculated is arbitrary and capricious. It, it, it's based on the statute, but there's no master science behind it. So, um, so that new growth and, and, and bumping up against it, you know, things, we had the conversation at the classification hearing, if, uh, personal property, right? That's not somebody building a, 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 building a, uh, a building that's gonna be there and appreciate over time. You know, it's the difference between buying a house and buying a car. The, hard, the car depreciates, right? But for purposes of Prop 2 and a half, we're able to count that for calculation of our lighting capacity. These are all gyrations that we go through. And really, all it means at the end of the day is whether or not we have the decision at town meeting to increase taxes beyond the limits of just a 2 and a half increase, or we have to go to the voters for an override. Now, obviously, town meeting is a, a lower hurdle, right? But once you hit that limit, then anything that you need uh, to survive uh, and to maintain your services, you have to go to the voters. And, and there's fatigue there. You're not gonna go to the voters for $50,000, right? You're gonna go to the voters after you've cut, 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 and you've, you've, you've done as much as you can, and then literally the services that they count on are gonna start not being functional. Um, so, uh, so these numbers here, again, they're estimates. The only thing I can guarantee you is that the tax impact, for all the reasons we talked about tonight, isn't gonna go down. It's only going to go up. The good news is that we have, because we've managed ourselves well over the last 10 years, that we have, the, we have that capacity. And I'll go back to the comment uh, uh, that I've heard, that you might have hear, heard people say, like, we have this whole mall in. Where did all those tax dollars go? Where did those tax dollars go? Well, where they went was, during the years, here, 10 through 14, look at how flat tax bills went up $20 less than, on average it was, the tax bills went up less than $100 a year over that time period. Because we had new tax dollars coming in from that economic development, and we didn't just take that and add it to the taxes, increase the taxes on 
the residents on top of that. The residents got a break here during a tough recessionary time. Again, the timing was great. Some of it's dumb luck. This is good policy decision and management on the part of the boards and committees. And what, what happened by not taxing to the max here is we created the levy capacity that we're drawing from now. So that was all smart, good planning and foresight. But now you're here. This is what normal increases look like, right? And then this is where you know, things are going. Because again, for all the reasons I just said, the new growth isn't going to be there, state aid isn't going to be there. You know, so we're going to be more sustaining. And that trajectory isn't, that's not set in stone. You know, if we start making more tight decisions about budgets not going up 4% or 3.5% or 3 when you start getting 3 to 3%, three then you're going to start having conversations that are going to be a little bit more difficult for U.S. policy boards and committees about, okay, I can't live with a 3. In order to make that 3, I'm going to have to reduce something. I'm going to have to start cutting something back. And then you're going to have to figure out, well, are you comfortable with that or would you prefer another $20 increase in the tax bill and we maintain the current level of services? We're in that sweet spot, though. We're not. If you're at the limits of Prop 2.5, though, that conversation is every year. And it's ugly and it, it is exhausting for you, for the residents, for your staff, and for everything. So. But that's where we're at, folks, uh, right now. So in terms of our financial outlook, uh, our projections, we're still, we're still uh, assuming that budgets are going to increase to a level that will maintain our existing uh, staffing and services. Um, again, in terms of um, levy capacity, we're at 2.1 million. Based on these assumptions, by 2025, we've exhausted and then some our levy capacity. Tax increase is not going to be 3%. It's not going to be the rate of inflation. If you want to maintain your services, you're looking at something you know, above 4% with all likelihood. Um, and again, all of this assumes no major budget surprises. So that means the state aid doesn't get cut mid-year. Um, we don't have some uh, big issue in the town. Uh, you know, the water tower doesn't fall over. I don't know. It's just anything unexpected happening. Um, but we do have capacity, again, like I said, to deal with some limited time frame of unexpected stuff. Uh, the key here, if we're going to be sustainable, truly sustainable, it means continuing to take care of our unfunded liabilities, actively managing health insurance, um, making sure that we're, uh, that we're uh, continuing to look at these, this information. To, to Scott's point, at least once a year, uh, revisiting all this and having this conversation. And by the way, if something crazy happens, we don't, we're not going to go, oh, well, we can't have this discussion with our boards and committees until, this, until December of 2020. No, we'll get everybody together and say, hey, something's happened. This is what's going on. These are our options. Uh, we'll frame the issue up and we'll figure out what we, what's happening. Um, but as always, and, and, and this is something I want to stress uh, because I'm on my third or fourth superintendent and um, we have a culture of collaboration and working together. The relationship uh, that I had with Christine and the relationship uh, with, with Greg uh, is as good as it gets. And, and I think it's based on trust and transparency in information. You know, I'm showing him what we have. I'm showing you what we have. Everybody has an opportunity to look at this and question it. And then we need to figure out how do we get from point A to B working together under this, under this information. And I can't, I can't stress enough how good that relationship is. And extension of that, how good the relationship is between the school committee and the Board of Selectmen, and between the Board of Selectmen, the school committee, and the Appropriations and Financial Planning Committees. The people in this room care about the community. They work together. I've never seen anybody in this room hooting and hollering, beating their chest, and demanding unreasonable things from anybody that they can't deliver. And so we always are trying to hit that sweet spot between you know, you know, keeping things sustainable, but keeping the town with the high level of services that I think we all want to see and the residents want to see. So, so we need to keep monitoring. And with that, uh, it, just for the record, it was shorter than my presentation last year. <laughs> but it's important, listen guys, it's important that we have, we, you get this information, that you have a chance to ask questions and that we, we look at this on a regular basis. 
Otherwise, you're going to vote just like people do at town meeting. You're going to vote emotionally. I care about the schools, I, and, and, or I care about you know, police and fire. Uh, you know, and nobody cares about DPW. Scott's not here, so I, I, never, I never get people crowding my doorway saying, you need to give more money to DPW. Um, but, 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 you know, we're going to continue to work together to, to make sure that we're, we're not asking unreasonable things of each other and, and the residents understand why we're doing what we're doing. Nobody wants to see taxes go up. The reality is they're going to go up. But our job is to keep them reasonable. And, and balance to the level of services that we provide and, and the level of services people want to see. So, so with that, I'm happy to answer any, any questions. And actually, before, before I, I take any more questions, I do just want to acknowledge we have the, the financial team here. You got Jason Little, our finance director, Amy Haley. I know some of you probably haven't met her. She's our new treasurer collector. You'll be new for three years until I say you've been here. <laughs> and then Dan Brogy, our assessor. These people do a phenomenal job for you. In particular, when it comes to this data, though, this guy makes us all look good. This is, this is his analysis. This is his data. He's been beating this stuff up through the weekends for the last three weeks to get us here tonight. So Jason does a stellar job for us, and I, can't, I want to publicly thank him, and, uh, and I want you to, to, to realize what a great job he does for us. So, so with that, we'll answer any, any other questions that anybody may have. Yes, Laura. So when you projected out to 2025, and you said that we would need an override to maintain services, um, when you say that, would there need to be um, a town vote for that override? Yeah. Georgia. It would start with the, 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 the boards and committees would make a decision that they want to pursue an override. Then it would have to go through town meeting, and it would be at the ballot. So for clarification, I run a town where we did, we did have prop two and a half, but Norford is not, is what you're saying? All towns in Mass uh, have to comply with Proposition two and a half. Okay. That, I, I was speaking of Connecticut. Okay. So Prop two and a half is a, is a Mass general law that only applies in, in Mass. Got it. So that, that override means that our taxes would need to increase more than that two and a half in order yes. to maintain services. Yeah. Okay. I think the, yes, I think the sweet spot here or the, or the message to the taxpayers is yes, taxes are going up uh, because we're accessing that levy capacity, but we wouldn't have that levy capacity had we taxed you to the max all those years ago. So we gave, we didn't tax to the max, we created that levy capacity because we didn't have to have it. Like I said, we could have just as easily taken all that new revenue from the mall and then gave a reasonable, you know, a, a reasonable tax impact or increase on the residents as well. But again, we took that in, we maintained our services, and we, we held the budget pretty tight because that recession was scary. It was deep, and it was fast, and nobody knew when it was going to end. And so we dug in, and the residents benefited from that. Like one year, literally, the average tax bill went up $20. And they consistently, uh, on average, was less than, well, less than $100 for four or five years. That's pretty good. And by not taxing to the max of two and a half, you create that capacity. The issue now is you know, we need to access that if we're going to maintain services. So we didn't, ta we didn't tax before. We need to come back. But our job, again, is if we're doing things really well as a, as a group, um, is that we want to keep forestalling hitting that wall. And, you do that through getting new growth on the front side. That's just a formulaic way. And the other is making sure is, is, is constraining the growth. And that's why we always start our budgets from the premise of maintaining the level of services we have now and increasing staffing and services marginally that matches what we reasonably can increase our revenue so that they're running together. I didn't go into it, but there's another uh, indicator that shows revenues per capita and expenditures per capita and you don't want those lines to crisscross. Years ago they did uh, and we were using one-time revenues in the form of free cash to, to make that work. That's not a sustainable practice and we haven't done that since 2000 and uh, fiscal 10. So was there another question over here? Leslie? Yeah, first of all thank you very much. 
Oh, you're really getting good at these presentations. <laughs> in fact, I think it ought to be a podcast so that people can listen to these in their, in their cars. And well, we will, run it, we, we will run it on YouTube, so anybody who wants to, yeah. to watch it again after you leave here tonight, it'll be up there eventually. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Um, uh, what determines whether we pay more or less into OPEV? Right now we're trying to pay the 550 each year. Mm -hmm. um, at what point do we say, gee, do we want to pay 575? Do we want to go back to 500? Yeah. What, is, what kind of thresholds are we looking at that determine that? That's a great question. So it's a massive unfunded liability, right? And 550 is not what we should be putting in. I think we should, was it like 1.5 or between 1.5 and 2 million is really what we should be putting in. Uh, and uh, so what we do is uh, every couple of years we have to pay an actuary to reevaluate our liability and that's why that number changes. In part it changes because um, the trends in healthcare costs. One of the reasons, remember we said it went from 44 to 34 million, the, right? One of the other factors that I didn't mention was the fact that we actually, our increases in health insurance have been lower than they, than they originally had forecast. Like I said, our, our health insurance budgets on average for the last 11 years have gone up 3.1%. That is way below the GIC and way below most other people because we've worked with the school department and we've worked with the employees to manage that actively. Um, but what happens is every couple of years you have a, a, a new evaluation and then you have to have the conversation about what, uh, what you can put away. I always draw the analogy when it comes to OPEB to your own personal retirement fund. If you meet with an advisor, few people put in what they would like you to put in because you can't afford to. But what do they tell you? Put in what you can because the longer you put it off, the worse it gets. So what we did is we put in what we could and it's meaningful. It's not like we're putting $20,000 a year in. Okay, this is real money. It's $3.8 million that's in there now. So what your financial advisor would tell you is put what you can and then every year reevaluate whether or not you can increase that, which is what we do. And last year, we made a concerted effort to increase that 500,000 500, to 550,000. I would love to see us increase it by 50,000 every year. That would be meaningful and that would really scale this thing up considerably. But you just saw what I went through, you know. I, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we have. But every year we should talk about it, and every two years we'll have new information from the actuary to show us how are we really doing. It just so happens this, this pass through, it will look a lot better. Our liability dropped by $10 million. That's great because we'll put money aside. Our healthcare trends are doing, we're bucking the trend. They're doing better than the average. So again, these things all help. So, but you just need to keep revisiting it. Just like. Again, your personal retirement account, you should be looking at minimally once a year sitting down with a financial advisor to see where you are and whether or not you're hitting your targets. That's what we do. Do we ever envision the state mandating anything further in terms of how much we're supposed to be paying and would they expect us to, to spend less in another area so that we can put more toward? That was a, that's a good question. And that was, so the question is whether or not the state could mandate us to pay more. Um, the, state, the state has their own OPEB problem. Of course, nothing ever stopped the state from imposing things on us that they exempt themselves from, like the open meeting law, the public records law, I can go on. Um, by the way, everybody knows that the state, the legislators exempt themselves from the public record law and the open meeting law, right? They can go in the back room, make up the deal, they come out and they just take their votes. I just want everybody to know that. Um, that's a possibility, I don't think that's, Likely, um, the two more likely scenarios are that the state would change the statute to um, move to a graduated benefit like they did pension. We talked about that earlier, which would help our liability. And then really the big, the big bomb that could, not likely, but could happen is single payer health care, Medicare for everyone. That would impact this. And then they'd have to come up with legislation for how this irrevocable trust fund would then be used. But I would love to cross that bridge when we came to it. And this, you know, that just, that liability disappear. But those are the two more likely scenarios. I don't think the state has a stomach, particularly now moving into potentially 
tighter economic times to, to, to mandate that. But they can't even meet it. They have huge unfunded liabilities for OPEB, uh, just like everybody does. We are a hand, we're one of a handful of communities in Massachusetts that have made meaningful strides. And as I said, when we get rated by the bond rating, uh, by uh, bond rating agencies, when we go out to issue debt, they specifically call out the fact that we've, we've done something. And it puts us ahead, it makes us more credible. And it also just shows that we're aware of the problem and we're not just sticking our heads in the sand, we're trying to address it. And that shows you've got good policy, good management, and good boards and committees that have the political will to be consistent to do things that, that isn't sexy and exciting, like put money aside for a problem that's going to manifest itself in 30 years, right? Just like it's hard to put money aside for retirement when the demands are here now. The kids want to go on vacation. You want to buy a new car. You want to have a nice house. You know, retirement's so far off, I'll worry about it later. That's how you get yourself in trouble. You know, part of the reason why we do fiscal indicators is to interject those long-run issues and those long-term perspectives into the annual budget process. Otherwise, the easiest thing to do is go, ooh, budgets are getting tight. You know what? Let's just not put that half a million dollars into OPEB and we'll spend it on operating expenses instead. That's not illegal. You could do that. That wouldn't be smart, just like it wouldn't be smart to stop putting money in your personal retirement account to expand your, your level of living. You, know, you could do it, but it's not recommended. Any other questions? Jason? Uh, yeah, John, I'd just like to, well, thank you, your financial team, and the school superintendent and his staff for, uh, uh, for the collaboration that does go on uh, in order to identify the problems that we might be facing in each upcoming budget year and trying to find a resolution for those um, in a constructive way um, that gets us through these. It seems like, looking back over the last decade, there's any number of things that have occurred with uh, health insurance, um, with the recession, um, with major capital projects that we've undertaken or whatever problems that have to be solved along the way and it's through this collaboration and this constructive process that we kind of find solutions to those problems or get, them, get us through those difficult points. So just want to thank everybody involved because that's been a very uh, significant component of our success in managing the budget over this past decade. Um, you had, uh, we're facing, I guess, for the second year in a row, this enrollment transition, uh, which is shifting a greater proportion onto Northboro. And there was a mention of potentially some relief through excess and deficiency funding. I guess I just want to be sure I understand that clearly. Um, we're in a circumstance where even if there was some excess deficiency that could be applied, we're still going to be drawing down levy capacity on our yes. side to, to do that. And if there is a component of excess and deficiency that can be applied, that's going to be applied to the really the benefit or relief of both towns, right? Correct. That's not something that would just be focused or directed entirely to Northboro's side of the equation. So, uh, so from that standpoint, there's a limit to what can be accomplished with excess and deficiency anyway, just from that fact that it's a proportionate sharing of what and, and we've had a number of conversations. This was a, a conversation we had at great length with um, Christine Johnson, the prior superintendent, and they have a policy that they would want to maintain reserves at 3%, uh, and, uh, and that's a relatively new policy. Um, but uh, so I think we're hoping there's some room for discussion in there. Uh, because again, you know, we're trying to, you know, you hear me sit up here and talk about having reserves for unexpected things and you know all of the hitting all the the points well you know you can't beat up the school committee and, and the school superintendent for doing the same things at their level but i think we're at a point now um there is I, there's something there um, it's going to require some more discussions but um we're cautiously optimistic that you know there's um whatever they have above that policy at least should, should be able to be applied and that's going to require some, some additional work uh, on that. So we don't know how much it's going to be, but I have every confidence that the, the school superintendent and the school committee is going to be, as always, a partner in, 
in the bigger picture of what we're always trying to do here. That has been our history in Northboro. That's been our history for a decade. You know, I just want to point out for folks at home who might be watching, you know, there was a time where you go to town meeting and the, the general government and the schools were fighting and over limited resources. There were lots of arguments. There was limited information. And what happens is people show up and they care about the town. They're going to vote emotionally, right? Your job, my job, but your job, you exist to advise town meeting, and it means you're spending hours in meetings like this looking at data like that so that you can advise those people, to advise the residents of Northboro from an informed position. And for the 10 years, we've had unanimous support of every member of every board and committee on all of our budgets and every capital project. And there are some people out there who look in on that and they go, oh, nobody's asking hard questions or, you know, everything's getting rubber stamped. No, we've got a great, we got great information and a great process and we hone it year after year. And so when we go to town meeting and everybody's on the same page, it's because we have spent six to nine months working all this stuff out in a meaningful way so that we're going to a town meeting with a compromise that everybody can hopefully support. And I'm hoping, you know, there's no reason to think fiscal 2021 won't be any, any different. Um, but it's my, my, you've heard me say this before, it's like water ballet. If you're watching water ballet, above the surface is just grace and beauty, right? But you ever seen the camera dip below the surface? All you see is like hundreds of legs flailing in every which direction. That's what makes that beauty possible. Well, the legs flailing is all the work that gets done behind the scenes before we get to town meeting because, frankly, town meeting isn't the place to be hashing this stuff out. You've got to, you've got to frame it up and come with a, a compromise. That's our job. That's your job, to come to town meeting with something that's reasonable. And then the voters decide. But it's very powerful when we're all on the same page and, uh, and they know that work has been done. So, thank you. Anything else before we wrap up? Thank you very much. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate your service to the town. And I appreciate uh, taking this message back out to our residents and, um, and putting us in a good position for having another good town meeting. So thank you for your attention tonight.